much as uh, as much as they do the live thing. So we'll we'll record this if it's okay, Roy. Sure. All right. So I wanted to. I know many of you on already know Roy, uh, but I thought what a better what a better gift on Valentine's Day than sharing uh, a man with you guys that has been so influential in my wife, in my life, and with my wife. Uh, my wife Kristen is on. Happy Valentine's Day, honey. She must not be. Is the is the hair not done or the makeup not done? I think her mic's muted. Her mic's muted. She just don't want to be on. She's she a little camera shy. She doesn't like the spotlight like I like it, Roy. I got it. <laughs> so I just wanted to share, Roy, with you. Uh, we do, uh, for many of you on, you probably know that I am in mortgage coaching. What's up, Matt McCormick? Hey, Chad. Thanks for your address, buddy. I just sent your letter. I uh, appreciate it. Sorry you didn't have the right one. So um, I just got to say that um, I don't know where I would be. There's kind of three things that came into my life at, at one time when I was in a deep, dark place. One of them was my beautiful wife, Kristen. Uh, the other was the core training. I uh, got my business in order. And of course, Christ. Um, and, you know, Roy is someone who has brought me much closer to Christ. Uh, he's made me a better father. He's made me a better husband. He's definitely made me a better leader. And uh, I can't think of too many people in my life that have been more impactful uh, in those three areas than Roy. So I, what I can say, you know, some things Roy has helped me uh, with. I had this fear over money going away, uh, grew up with not a lot and just always super fearful about money and uh, I would take that out on my wife. So he gave me something really simple once. He said, well, y'all just can only talk about it once a month and that's it. And don't talk about it other months. And that's been, gosh, that has saved, saved my marriage with Kristen. I just don't hold the money over her head anymore. We have very open conversations about things. And uh, that's just one thing I can say has, has really helped me be a better, better father, not live in fear and a, definitely a better husband. Uh, I think a weekly date night that he assigned me a long time ago, I now take my daughters out one week and then I take Kristen out the, the other week. So we have an every other week date night and I feel it's my job as a father to show my daughters uh, what they should be looking for in a man. So that is another thing I can directly attribute to, uh, to Roy's coaching me and to just his assignments. And then I think the third thing is uh, starting my day in scripture, starting my day. Uh, we have a little leadership. I don't know if you can see it, but I start my, my every day with this and many of my team members are on and uh, they can definitely say that they've seen a change in me when we start our meeting with that every day. And um, we've just all connected on a more personal level through that coaching and through that leadership. So uh, Roy has an event. Uh, that we do together called the core training summit and he has a marriage class that he does there and it's one of my favorite classes that I take and he just does such an exceptional job in um, talking about what he tries to do to to be a good man of Christ to be a good husband his wife Mary's on if I say anything incorrect Mary that he doesn't do that he doesn't do you can call him out on it on on this okay um, but okay. I just Kristen and I really look up to their marriage. They've helped us have a stronger marriage. And um, I just wanted to share Roy with you on this day of love, which is Valentine's Day. So I'm gonna share his screen uh, or I'm gonna share his PowerPoint. I'm gonna moderate for him. And um, we want this to be interactive. So please enter in your questions into the chat and I will stop Roy and ask him the questions. My job is to moderate and make sure your questions get answered. So. My man, my friend, Pastor Roy Mason. Well, thank you, Chad. It's a, uh, a, a honor to listen to all that stuff you said about me. About 5% of what he said is true. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, we're not nearly as, as good as you, you think we are. Uh, I'm glad Mary's here with me because she can uh, call bull on stuff. Uh, I want to <laughs> tell you, Mary and I just celebrated our 44th wedding anniversary. That's um, awesome. So 44 years she's put up with me. We've known each other longer than that. We met, uh, I liked her in the sixth grade. 
it took her till about the 11th grade to like me back. <laughs> but, but but I was persistent. Uh, I stayed the course. I kept, I didn't change. I kept being the same guy, but I'm thankful that God put us together and we've been married 44 years. I remember one time when I was a young pastor, I asked a man, um, they were celebrating their golden anniversary, their 50th anniversary. And I asked, I, that sounded like an eternity to me back then. Uh, right. Somebody had been married 50 years. And I asked him, I was trying to be this young, bright pastor, and I'll never forget, I looked at him and I said, uh, sir, well, tell me, what's the secret to a long marriage? And he kind of looked around the room a little bit and looked at the other people there, and he pulled me off to the side, ju just took one last look to find out where his wife was, and he says, preacher, it takes a lot of forgiveness. And you know, I remembered that, and I thought that meant that she, that I had to forgive her for a lot of stuff. But through the years, Chad, I've learned like you have already, it's they have to forgive us for a lot of stuff. Yes. You know, the truth is Mary and I told Mary years ago, I didn't want to celebrate Valentine's Day because I think it's a holiday made up by the Hallmark Company. But, you know, I got up, I went this weekend while she was out doing something. I went and bought a card. I wrote it out for her. I hid it until this morning. And before I left, she was still in the bed. I left it laying beside the coffee pot so she would have it. She is my Valentine and I love her so much. Now, let me ask you, how long have you guys been married? Who's been married more than 10 years? Chad, how many hands you see go up? Uh, I see, let me scroll through one. Two. Anybody, anybody been married more than 10 three. years? We got about five that's been married longer than 10 years. Wow. Well, that's good. So now listen, how many have been married less than a year? Anybody? Eric and I are right out of year. There you go. So you're one year. So yeah. you have learned the same stuff in a year that the rest of us have learned in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. The truth is there's some very basic things that I think we need to learn. A theme that I came up this year uh, with the core is I said I wanted us to learn to be the glue in 22, to be the glue in 22. Uh, now, what does that mean for us? Well, I think the glue really comes out is that it begins with the words you see there of gratitude. The truth is we're never going to have a good life together. We're never going to have a good year if we don't learn to live in a spirit of gratitude for all that God has done for us. Now, I want to apologize on the front end. I'm a Baptist preacher. I make no apology for including the things of God in this. If it offends you, I'll ask you to forgive me, but I just can't help myself. I can't help telling all the goodness that God has done and he does in my life. I had someone tell me the other day, they had a friend that claimed to be an atheist. And they said, I don't know how to talk to them. I said, just be you. Just talk to them about the things that are important to you. And if someone says, well, I'm offended when you talk about God, I always stop them and go, wait a minute. You don't believe God exists. How are you offended by something you say doesn't exist? And then just share your faith. Now, I say that to get it off the table. We have to have gratitude in everything we do. If we're going to be the glue, we also have to learn to have loyalty to the other people in our lives. Now, this being the glue doesn't just work in marriage. It works in everything we're involved in. So learn to show loyalty. That's a lost art in the world today. You guys are mostly in the mortgage business. Some of you are realtors, but that's a lost art of showing loyalty to the people around us. But I want to tell you how you stay married 44 years is to never have a question about loyalty. I don't worry about that. I don't think Mary worries about that. I'm going to be loyal to her and she's going to be loyal to me. Thirdly, if we're going to be the glue, there has to be some unity in everything that we do. We're in this together. A marriage is not just all you by yourself. It is a, you, if it's all by yourself, you've got bigger issues. So the truth is, there is a unity involved in being the glue, but then there also has to be some empathy in that, sharing one another's feelings, find out how they're feeling, find out what's going on with them. Now, the foundation of being the glue, I told you, started out with gratitude, but there are really three words you hear from me all the time. They're what I call the three Gs, grateful, gracious, and generous. Just think about your own life right now. 
Where are you not showing gratitude for the others in your life? Where are you not showing gratitude for your team? Where are you not showing gratitude for your partners out there in business, your partners? Where are you not showing gratitude to the most important people in your life? Does your spouse, does your partner know that you're grateful for them? How do they know it? How do they know it if you don't tell them? Carmen said she's been married just about a year. Listen, Eric needs to know that you are grateful for him. But, but Eric needs, uh, Carmen needs to know that Eric is grateful for her. We need to share that with one another. I'm sorry to pick on you. I just have to see you on the corner of my screen. You're good. But, you can okay, pick on me as much fine. as you want. <laughs> okay. No, no, I won't pick anymore. But the truth is we have to show that. Some of you that have been married a long time, have you struggled with loyalty? And that doesn't mean you're unfaithful physically, but is your mind disloyal to them? Does your mind go in a million directions sometimes when you're sitting there? You know, the one thing that frustrates most of us is uh, the, the stupid cell phones. You know, we're all tied to these things. Now, I've told you this before. Don't call me after 530 because this is in my car. You know, now the truth is you can call Mary if you need me. Hers is never in the car. She's got hers beside her. That's okay. You got to have a way to get up with people. But the truth is, I don't want to be tied to this anymore. I'm not going to be a slave to it. Some of you could in, enhance your relationship right now if you just turned off those silly cell phones and just be engaged where you are. So now the, the next thing I want to ask you, though, as we move from being the glue, I, I want to ask you this. What kind of what kind of agreement do you live in? You see, there's, there's, you're in one of two positions always. You're either in a transactional unity or you're in a relational unity. Now you say, well, that sounds funny. I don't know what it means because I, I wanted to say you're either in a transactional relationship or a relationship relationship, but you can't, it can't be transactional and relational. Now, let's find out for you in your life, and I'm not going to call you out, but I want to ask you very, very simply, which one of these do you do? Let's look at being transactional. That always asks this, what do I get out of this arrangement? You know, when you're going to a discussion, you go into a, a conversation, if you always enter it by saying, what do I get out of this? There's a great chance you are just in a transactional union. What do I get? A relational, on the other hand, says, what do I give? What do I give to that? What do I give to this unity? Which one do you want to be a part of? Finding out what he gives or finds out what he's, what he's trying to get? Finding out what she gives or finding out what she tries to get? That's a game changer when you come to understand that. Just ask it. Most of you are smarter than I am. But I have to ask myself these questions. I have to say, am I looking to get something or am I looking to give something? I try my best. And I think Mary will tell you this. I try my best to put her first in all that I do. It doesn't, Mary will ask me, where do you want to go for dinner? I could care less. I want to go where she wants to go. Now, she gets kind of snippy sometimes with me. And she says, well, I, I don't care where we go. I said, then we'll stay at home. Well, I didn't cook anything to eat. Do we have peanut butter? <laughs> I mean, I'm okay with a peanut butter sandwich. I don't care. But I want her to be happy in all of that. The next thing, a transactional person is always saying, well, we're going to keep in touch with each other. But a relational person says, I want to keep each other informed. You know, Chad was talking about when they argued about money or did about this. Listen, that's just getting in touch. Being informed is bringing it at the right time and just going over with it. And then the greatest lesson all of you will learn through this whole time we have today is very simply this. It isn't in the notes. I want you to write down this word, F-I-D-O, FIDO. This will solve every problem you ever have in any relationship you have. Now, what does it mean? Anybody know? It's Mary so knows. Forget it, drive on. Forget it, drive on. Now, I grew up in a Navy house. Now, I want to tell you the F was not forget it in, in a Navy house. 
<laughs> but it's the same message. <laughs> if we can learn to do that, ladies and gentlemen, where we don't harbor it, because you know what Paul said over in 1 Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. If you forget it and drive on, you're not keeping a record of wrongs. Think about the last time you brought up something from the past. You did it when you were angry. You did it when you were frustrated. You did it because you were trying to get your way. You were trying to prove your point. It does no good to bring up something from the past. Learn to forget it and just drive on. So I'll stay in touch or we'll keep informed. Thirdly, a transactional person says they're looking to win the conflict. Does that sound like you? You're a better arguer than the other one? You pride yourself in being, being better at spinning a yarn. And all of you salesmen are great at that. That's what you do every day. And often you go home and try to be a salesman when you get home. They don't want a salesman. They want a husband, a wife, a partner. That's what they're looking for when you get home. When you walk in, if you're the husband, she's the boss. You can be the boss all day long, but let her be the boss when you get home. You don't know anything about running that place anyway. <laughs> you, you don't know where, you know, I have to ask Mary, where, where is, where is the ketchup? I don't know where she puts it but she knows, and I don't care where she puts it. Let her be the boss. You're not trying to win the conflict. You see, a relational person is trying to resolve the conflict, to resolve the conflict. Now, how do you do that? How do you go about resolving the conflict? Well, that means discussing it, talking about it, moving on with it, moving forward with it. So if you're transactional, you're all about winning it. If you're relational, it's all about resolving it. Now, here's the bottom line. A transactional person is always living in fear. They're living in fear. I don't know what you're afraid of today, but you're afraid of something. If you're just being transactional, I promise you, it's coming from a position of fear. But if you're relational, it comes from a position of faith. Those are the two options. Now, anything I've said so far, do you have questions or comments about? Anybody at all? I got one. So when you're, when you're in, you know, just speaking of conflict and yep. it, it does get to a place where maybe, you know, it's heated or you can feel, you know, your, your spouse getting upset. It, do you feel it's better to continue to have the conflict then and, and resolve it? Or do you think it's better to cool down and come back to it? Well, I, listen, I, I believe there's a couple of things there. I, I think we ought to do all that we can to, to not be confrontational, but to be communicational. It, you know, it's how you present something that creates the conflict. I mean, the conflict comes when you're on this transactional side, when you're trying to, what can I get? I'll, I'll keep you, I'll keep in touch with you. I'm going to win this argument. Listen, there, there doesn't need to be arguments about it. Have conversation about it. Now, if it starts to blow up, you know, what, what have I told you a million times, Chad? Stop it. Just stop and say, whoa, whoa, this isn't, this isn't what I was intending to talk about at all. I'm wrong. Listen, the, the secret is always saying this, honey, I'm wrong. It's my fault. I'll do better. Now, do you always believe that, guys? Not always, no. Do you believe it's always your fault? It usually is my fault, but I don't always believe it. Yeah. Okay, listen. It, it, it is your fault because God sets you up to be the spiritual head of that household. Right. So there's, it's like anything of you guys that are connected with the core or you're connected in Chad's office or you're connected wherever – it's always the boss's fault. Now, let me say that another way. It, it may not be his fault, but it is his problem. Because when something's going in a wrong direction, the one in leadership, <clears throat> if you're in a leadership role in your company, 
you're a manager, you're any of those things. Whatever goes wrong underneath you is just like in your relationship at home. You're, it may not be your fault, but it's your problem. Right. So to answer your question, Chad, if it starts to blow up, stop it. Walk away, take a breath. That, that's all you got to do. So yes, that's fear you're operating in when it goes that way. Faith says we can put it off another minute. Yes, Sam. You, you started by saying you can be either transactional or relational. Is that the kind of person you are or is that each relationship you can be in one of those? Oh, no, I, I, I think, honestly, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a transactional person and your personality lines up on that side of the screen, I think you're going to carry that with it most places you go if you don't do something about it. Okay. Now, which one do you think, which of these two sides do you believe more accurately represents what God intends for us to be? Relational. Relational. You know, transactional is a, I'm the least religious guy you'll ever meet because religion is really all about you trying to get to God. You know, what we have in Christianity is a faith that says when we couldn't get to God, he came to us. So he is the author of relationships. So that's what we're to pattern after. If you read through the New Testament or the Old Testament, you see God being very, very strict sometimes, but it was always based in being relational with his people, getting them where he could bless them and be close to them. So that's a great question. If you tend to go that way, you know, that's, that's probably who you are by nature. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So, so what, what do we do about that, though? Well, the first thing we have to understand is we have to decide what is the language we speak? You know, we, we all speak a certain kind of language. Now, years ago, my, my friend Gary Chapman, who was a pastor down the street from me in High Point, he was in over in Salem, he wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. Anybody ever read that or, or know about it? How, do you know the language you speak? How many of you know that? Um, Chad, go, go, go ahead a couple of slides and just show that, that the love language test. The next one, next one. Yeah, you know, all of you can get this and I can get it to you. Chad can get it to you. And you ought to do this about once every year or, or so. And do it with your spouse and say, what is their primary love language? But because all of us, I keep written on my, uh, on my computer a sticky note. I'm old. I still use sticky notes. I got one written on my computer screen that just says acts of service, words of affirmation, physical touch, quality time, receiving gifts. And I try to find out about every person that I'm talking to, what is their primary language. Now, now go back up to the one before that, Chad, the, where I said, sometimes we have to learn to speak a new language. Now, what do I mean by that? Often what we do, I spend a lot of time traveling to other countries. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a missionary, goes through a lot of different places. And I have this one story that I can never forget. There was a, you, you'll see Americans, we're the worst. I was taking all these people with me on a trip. We get to an airport. I think we were in, um, I think we were in Romania. And we get to the airport. We finally landed. Somebody, one of our guys is not going to follow me. He's going to take care of himself. So he goes up to the lady at the counter and I listen to him and he's just, he's just screaming at her. He was asking about changing a seat on an airplane and he got louder and louder and louder. The problem was not that she couldn't hear him. The problem was she couldn't understand him. I mean, her English was a second or third language, but even more important than that, he was a redneck from North Carolina. <laughs> and I mean, his language, I could barely understand. And she sure couldn't understand it. I remember walking up to him, putting my hand on his shoulder. I said, sir, it's not that she can't, she can't hear you. She can't understand you. So I began to speak for him to this lady and he got exactly what he wanted. Listen, sometimes, sometimes we speak the language we speak so loud not realizing that our partner doesn't speak that language. Now, here's what I mean. If your partner's, uh, if your love language is acts of service, you know, you like, 
people taking care of you that way, doing things that take the stuff off of you. And look what it says there about acts of service. Vacuum, vacuuming the floors can be an expression of love. Anything you do to ease the responsibilities weighing on a person is an act of service you can do for them. So let's say that's your great love language. But let's say your partner's love language is words of affirmation. You, you scream to them acts of service. You try to do that for them all the time, and you're wondering why they never appreciate it. It's because they don't speak that language. Well, the only language they speak are words of affirmation. So you have to know your spouse's love language. Okay, Chad, I'm going to put you on the spot. What's Kristen's love language? Uh, quality time and acts of service. Is, is that right, Kristen? I think she had to jump off to go. Pick oh, okay, up. okay. Um, who else knows your act of service? I mean, who, uh, Carmen, do you know Eric's love language? Yes, I do. What's, what's his love language? Words of affirmation and acts of service. And, and what is your love language? Uh, the opposite. <laughs> okay, okay. But, but do you hear the point I'm making here? Yeah. You will speak your language very, very loud. Yeah. But, but if that's not the other person's love language, they're not hearing anything. Yeah. So you, you do this test, do it with everybody in your life. You ought to do it with people on your team and everything else. What is their primary and secondary love languages? Because once you begin to speak that to them, they're going to hear it more and more clearly. So take some time to learn to speak this new language. Anybody got any questions at that point? When you Somebody say said, we should do this once a year, Roy. I think you... so. Yeah, because I think our language changes. That's why I was just going to ask. Do you think we can change? Oh, absolutely. I, I think it changes circumstantially. I think it changes uh, philosophically. I think it changes just with age. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it changes with everything, but I do think your primary language will always stay the same. So but I, but I think your I think your secondary language change. will change. So my daughter's uh, receiving gifts. She's never coming off of that. I'm going to be having to buy these gifts for her forever. <laughs> if that's her <laughs> primary language. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir, it is. <laughs> I'll let you know when it changes. Our daughters are, you know, how old are they married? Uh. 41 and 34. Yeah. And their, their language, they still like gifts. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, and you know, listen, Mary would deny part of her love language is, is receiving gifts. She would say, no, 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 that's not important to me, but I want to tell you it, it's true because I can watch when I give her a little something, it doesn't have to be big and fancy and elaborate, but, but she's so happy for it and proud of it. Roy? Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I like hearing this because Kathy and I just became empty nesters. So we're, we're the old married couple. We're at 33 years married right out of college, the whole thing. But our, our love language has changed. So for example, acts of service and quality time have kind of, depending on the kids' ages and where we were on the journey, and, um, and now quality time, because now with the girls gone, it's really, really important Whereas acts of service doing it for 30 some odd years, you know, it, it, yeah, this, and we've done this for the team. And I'll tell you that sure helps because we, um, we had a, we had a delayed birthday. I mean, sorry, not a delayed Christmas party because of COVID. And I've used this to actually um, really focus in on what the gifts are for them. And it really was a smash hit. There you go. Awesome, Listen, man. everybody wants you to understand them. I mean, that's the truth. Every person in your chain of command or in your in your area circle of influence, they 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 want to be heard. You know, I deal, my team is primarily in West Africa. I went through this with them and they did this test, and it's unbelievable what they now know about themselves. And, and so most of them, most every one of them, what what do you what would any of you guess a West African's primary love language is? Um, affirmation receiving gifts i would say quality time i'd say words gifts as of well. affirmation uh, because they've been beat down and beat up their whole life wow 
And, and so there's there's one, the oldest guy we have over there, he's a, a just turned 70 years old. He is the only one that it's receiving gifts. But he's been a giver all of his life to everybody and nobody's ever given to him. So I have to be sure to give to him. So I think what Matt's telling you, all learn from this. You can do this with your team and it'll be a game changer. Learn to speak their primary language. Hey, Roy, other, can I ask a quick question here? Sure, sure. Since I have so many of my business partners on, I'm going to turn this just to a quick tactic to sure. help us make a little money too. Um, what? How can we do this with our clients? How can we find out their love language so we can speak their love language throughout the transaction and just cater to them at a higher level? Got any ideas there? You're asking me? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, Mary and I went last weekend to our favorite restaurant. We eat there once a year. I, I can't afford to eat there, but once a year. Um, you, you know, when you get your bill, before you pay your taxes, uh, tax and tips, it's 350 bucks. It's a lot for me. But I'm going back next year. Because from the time we made the reservation until we left the facility at the end of the meal, all they did was love on us. They took care of us. They asked us questions. Everybody came by, calling us by our name, bringing the stuff they knew we liked. They just gave us that kind of service. And I looked at it and said, man, I've started asking everybody I talk to every week. I'll ask them before I end. I'll say, did you get a Capitol Grill experience with me? Did you feel cared for and cared about? And if they say no, say, what could I have done better? Now, I don't care how much the bill is next year. We're going back because they make me feel that way. I think if you learn to pour that way into your team, Chad, and it yep. starts with you, that you got to be able to ask everyone on your team or our business relationship with you, did you get that kind of experience for me? If not, what could I have done better? Well, eventually that's going to become contagious and they start asking your clients those same things. And I'll promise you, it didn't matter what the bill was. I was happy to pay it because of the experience. I know you guys are worried about prices going up and rates going up. I'm telling you, if somebody feels cared about, they know you're taking care of them. They don't mind paying another half a percent, but, but they've got to feel that they've got to be cared for through it all. So you have to find ways to do that. What I'd encourage you to do, Chad, and this is money out of your pocket, not into your pocket. Mm -hmm. You got to take your team to one of those places and yes. let them see that. Now, what you have to do is call that restaurant first and tell them what you're doing and say, I want you to give them an over-the-top experience so they can learn what caring for looks like. So that, that's what I'd say. That's a great way that I've experienced recently. I think you can do that. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So now, now let's move. Anybody else have anything right there? Okay. Let, let, let's, let's go to this, this eight requirements of what a biblical union looks like. I mean, the, the first thing, there you go. Look at number one. It takes forgiveness. That we have to be a forgiving person in all our relationships. Your team will let you down sometimes, Chad. It doesn't help them to beat them up. It helps to lift them up and say, I forgive you, we'll get through this. You know, you've heard me say a million times, if you get in the mud, I'll get in the mud with you. We'll get through You and Rick are having a fight, I'll get in a fight with you. Now, the truth is, after we get you out of the mud, I'm gonna wonder why you were in the mud. Right. But while you're there, I'm gonna forgive. Is there something in your mind and in your heart, any of you, is there something you know right now you need to forgive your spouse for? Is there something you've been holding on to? Let it go. Practice forgiveness. Now, you may not have to bring it back up to your spouse. That doesn't always help. I mean, I'm not going to remind something, Mary, of something that happened six months ago. Now, I do that sometimes, don't I, honey? I'll bring up something from the past. But it's always when I'm, I'm pissed. Right. That's a sign of my weakness, not hers. Yes, sir. So I have to learn to let that stuff go because when you bring up something from the past, all you're doing is trying to jab a stake in them and turn it a little bit. That's not, 
That's not forgiveness. So we have to begin with forgiveness. But how do you have forgiveness? It's because it's built on faith. Number two, it's built on faith. Now, now faith, I remember it this way. Forsaking all, I trust him. Forsaking all, I trust him. If your trust is in God himself, that's where faith comes from. Listen, it takes faith to do all that we do. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what the market's going to do tomorrow. I don't know if Matt's going to have any houses out there in California to sell. I don't know who he's going to run into at Starbucks. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know this. God's in charge. And if I forsake all and trust him, nothing's going to come my way in my marriage or in my relationships with anybody that God's not sufficient for. So begin your day in faith. Do you have a practical way of beginning your day? You know, I, I read the Bible every morning. I pray every morning. I listen to Proverbs on my drive to work every morning. I get here, I read this and a couple other things that I'm reading every single day. And you know, for me, most of you guys uh, keep one of these things. Where'd I put mine for today? Most of you keep a, 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 a greatness tracker. I keep one just like you do. And what I've had to do is put into my greatness tracker on my calendar every day when I'm reading the Bible, when I'm doing devotions, when I'm doing that stuff. Do you put that in your calendar? Time slotted in your calendar when you're doing that. Because most of you have learned, just like I have, if it's not in your calendar, you're not likely to do it. But, it, but if you look at mine, it says at the very beginning, morning routine, um, devotion and reading, drive to work, go to bed. It tells me everything to do every single day. If it's not written down, I don't do it. So make your calendar indicative of what's important to you. That's how you're going to show your faith. <coughs> then thirdly, there has to be some friendship. You got to have friend. You got to be friends with your spouse. You got to be friends with them. Do the things that you enjoy. You got to have fellowship. What does that mean? I always remember fellowship. It's two fellas in one ship. Y'all got to be in the same boat. I, I remember when I first got to know Rick, um, he, he called me one, one Sunday right after church, and he says, you want to play golf? And I said, yeah, me and Mary are playing golf today. You can come join us. He goes, I ain't playing with no woman. I said, I guess you ain't playing with me today. <laughs> well, it took about 10 minutes. He called back and said, I'll come play with you. <laughs> and 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 Mary and him have so much fun picking on each other playing golf. It's the funniest thing you've ever seen. And but listen, I was in fellowship with Mary at that time. I wasn't going somewhere else. You got to be in fellowship with each other. Then you got to have a foundation. What is the foundation? For us, it's a personal relationship with Christ. Now, if you don't have that, you got to find a foundation you can build your marriage on. But let me just give you a word of advice here. The Bible says this, all other foundations are sinking sand. If your foundation is going to the casino or your foundation is going on luxurious trips and doing, all that's going to come to an end. But the one thing that lasts forever is the word of God. I could walk in our house right now, right beside Mary's chair where she sits every morning after I'm gone is her devotional book or Bible all those kind of things. We got a foundation that it's built upon. Do you know what your foundation as a family is built upon? Christ. Okay, Christ. How about the rest of you? Do you know what your foundation is? It's not wrong, but you got to know what it is and then decide that's the foundation we're going to build upon because only when you have a sure foundation are you going to know what the future is going to look like. Do you remember the little Disney cartoon movie called Up? Yeah. Yep, that's me and Mary. <laughs> you know, we're just going, that's who we're going to be. Our future is just together. I told her the other day, we watched something and somebody had died on it. And I, I said this, I said, baby, I sure, I sure hope I die for you, dude. Because you'll be fine. And I'll be a mess. 
because I, I don't know where nothing is. <laughs> I mean, I just know every day when I get up in the dark, my underwear is in the same place in the same drawer. I don't know how I got there. <laughs> I know my socks are right where they're supposed to be. This is where it's supposed to be. I don't know how none of it happens. I do know how it happens, but I'm going, I'll be at a loss without her. She is my everything. And I'm not ashamed to say that with her on the call. I mean, Chad, you've heard me say it before. She's my everything. Absolutely. So that's how you build a future together. Now, finance is a part of it. If you've got one that's a real spender, you, you got to talk about that. But but you can't fight about that. I, I was um, I was just we just got to understand that is that finances are a part of what we do. But but listen, I know there's a number you got in mind that if you get to this number, everything's going to be fine. Listen, if you got that kind of goal in mind, you're just looking for a place to quit. Now, listen to that carefully. You're just looking for the finish line. I'm going to tell you, when you hit the finish line, what do you do? What, what do those guys do from last night? They're celebrating winning the Super Bowl. I'm, I'm happy for them. You know, they're celebrating that. But some of those guys, that's the last time they're ever going to play football. And if they don't have something else in store, if football is all they are, it's going to be a miserable life. So look at your finances as a vehicle that gets you to a place you want to go next. What's next? And then the final word is fidelity. You have to remain faithful to each other. That, that, that your fidelity is without question. Now, we went through that really quick. Do, do you have any questions about that? Any of the eight, Roy? Yeah, 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 sure. So I was just going to ask you a question. And it's just, uh, it, it'll be with me my whole life. Uh, you know, I love baseball. I love sports. I love whatever. And Kathy, uh, how do I say this? It's a sacrifice for her to go do the things that I love, but she does it. How do I know how to keep things in check when I can, you know, live, breathe, eat it? I'm the kid that was, you know, had all the stats memorized when I was a kid, all that stuff back in the days of the newspaper. And I have to tell myself, because I know she won't, when, it, when is enough enough? So I keep it in balance. Okay, what, what does she like to do that you don't want to do? Um, see museums, arts, uh, a lot of arts in the city, things like that. Guess what you're going to spend some time doing? Yep. Going to the museums. Okay. Every time you go to a ball game or you get caught up in on television, you got to do something she wants to do. So is it really just kind of making a game of it to say like, okay, I, you're up two to one and I owe you a, new, a museum day? No, no, you want her to be indebted to you. Uh, you want to do more museums than you do ball games so that you can watch a ball game when you're, when you're ready to. But if I do that, though, I'm missing games while I'm at the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we talked about that earlier on the slide number two. It's all about you. <laughs> And, and listen, there, there's some reasons, I, we won't go into that. There, there's some reasons you do that. What, what I had to do, Mary loves to watch Hallmark movies. Oh God, they are the worst thing ever. Yeah. I mean, because every movie is the same movie. It's the same people. They just got snow one picture and they got rain another picture. I can't <laughs> stand them, but I made an agreement with her. When Hallmark movies come out at Christmas, the new ones, I'll watch every one with you. And I kind of like them at Christmas time because I like Christmas. But when I see the same story, Nats and Easter one, and they just got the same people, I just don't like it. But she loves them. But I know she enjoys us watching those together. So we make that a date night out of it. Now, another thing, Mary liked playing golf. So we started playing golf together. Um, she, I, I wanted to start shooting guns. And she said, I've never really shot a gun, but she likes it. And let me tell you, She's a much better shot than me. So we go to the range and shoot. We do those things together. I think you can find things like that to do together, but you got to give in more than you, you, you got to give out to them more than you take in from them. Does that make sense, Matt? Yes. Listen, the stats will be there tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? 
Uh, yes, hi, uh, that's Roy. It's Adam Kritikos. I got my wife on here. We're <laughs> um, Tanya. So we're, you know, you, you talk about the foundation of the relationship. Like, when did you, or how did you, because there's, you know, there's, there's family, there's kids, there's, you know, traction, all these things. How do you, like, when did you figure out what your foundation was or, you know, what, how do you figure that out or what's the, I don't know. Okay. Now, now remember that this, this class was about the, the union of two people. So that's not really the, you know, the foundation of a family. We can talk about that later. Chad will set up another one. We'll do that. But the truth is I found it out because I grew up in that foundational kind of environment with parents that had that kind of foundation you know, that, that, that we were always in church together. Uh, you know, we prayed together, we read the Bible, together, all those kind of things. So it's been a part of my life forever that I know the foundation, but it's also my calling that I've been in ministry since I was 18. And, you know, I start, I, you know, so that, that's kind of where it began, but, but family is a part of this, but your family, now this is going to sound horrible. If you don't have the right relationship with your spouse, you will never have the right relationship with your kids. Now they they may not embrace it. I mean, I, I've got I've got one of my daughters that has rejected all of that. But I, I'm not going to change because of that. She's still going to see the same picture over and over at them. And I mean, even them, they they appreciate it. Like Chad wrote something yesterday. Mary showed me on Facebook because I don't ever go on Facebook telling me how great this halftime show was going to be last night. You still feel that way, buddy? That was the best part of the game. I thought it was pretty good. Yes, I was a big okay. fan. I thought it was horrid. <laughs> I figured you would. <laughs> yeah, and I, we wrote our daughter, and she said, oh, y'all are too old for that. It was great. It reminds <laughs> me of my youth. And I said, well, it could be. That's why your adult life's like it is. But But the truth is, you know, the kids are going to have a different position than we do. Right. But I look at things and go, if it's not healthy and wholesome, I'm not sure it's what we ought to be a part of. Because here's a lesson I learned in my life long ago. Whatever goes in the well comes up in the bucket. Whatever you pour into you is what's going to come out of you. And, it, and if we're putting filth, filth, foul, foul into our bucket, when the going gets tough, that's what's going to come out of our bucket. Right. That makes sense? Yes, sir. That answer your question, Adam? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So let's move on quick. We're running out of time. The next thing I said is how do we elevate the person in our life? I just spell out the word. You got to encourage them. You got to always lift them up. You got to love them. You've got to engage with them. You have to value them. You have to affirm them. She wants to go to a museum. That's how you affirm her. You've got to trust them. And then more than anything else, you've got to enjoy them. Listen, I, I'm, I'm as happy as a lark sitting on the back porch with Mary out there, even if we're not talking. Just being out there together in that place. I enjoy that. You got to learn to enjoy the people in your life. I think those are the tactical steps. How do you encourage them? You speak words to them. You speak their love language. How do you how do you engage them? You spend time with them. You talk to them. You ask them questions. How, how do you value them? You know, speak their love language again. Let them hear it through your words, how important they are to you. Just speak to them. Then you, that's how you affirm them. That's how you trust them. That's how you enjoy them. Now, what, what else can we do? This is a wheel that I came up with a long time ago that says maybe you got to get you a wheel and put all the things that she likes to do and you like to do on it. And just when you're trying to come up with what are the ideas y'all want to do, just spin the wheel. And you don't get a do-over. Whatever it lands on, that's what we're going to do right now. See, one of them says sports day. One of them says movie nights. Um, one of them says go dancing. I'm sure glad Mary don't ever check that one. Um, you know, take a day trip. Um, you know, do, do all of those kind of things. This is brilliant, Roy. Just, just do, just, just spend, spend the wheel. 
and, and to play along that way. But then you also have to have some big box items. Like I had Chad in here the other day and he was telling me something. I said, you and Kristen got to get off by yourself for either a long weekend or, or something like that. And so Mary, he volunteered that you would come keep the children while he's uh, while he's off on a long weekend. I said, we'll come, we'll have them in shape when you get back. <laughs> they um, need that. <laughs> but, but the truth is you gotta have some big box items. Have you come up with that in your life? Do you have some big ideas you wanna do? You know, Mary always forever wanted, wanted to go uh, to, to find some ruins in, in, in the over, overseas. You know, look at archeological digs and stuff like that. Wanted to go to the pyramids. So my brain started going, how do we do that? Well, now we got to figure out how to do it and not get shot. But, but I mean, you got to have some big box items that you want. You know, she wanted to go to Hawaii. We went to Hawaii. You know, we, we went to Europe. We've done some of those things. Get some big box items and dream for them, plan for them, look forward to them. All the things we talked about, finance and everything else comes into play there. You know, put aside for that, that you know that's where you're going. Just because you got money in the bank doesn't mean you need to do it. All of you ought to be broke right now with the way the market is. Everybody's broke. It starts at zero every month. Everything starts over every month. That's how we do in ministry. That's how we do with our guys in Africa. But I make them come up with big box items as well. So I think if we do these kind of things, we're right back to where we started, that we can be the glue in 22. That if you learn to show gratitude, you stay loyal, you build unity, you have empathy with each other, you'll be where you want to be in your relationship and in your marriage. I wonder, do you have questions now you want to ask me? Anybody at all? It's been great got, for me to, me to sit here and yap like this. Go ahead, yeah, Matt. Matt. I got one. Let's just say that Chad's, his, um, his, one of his, uh, what do we call it? This, uh, sorry, the, uh, the five, the love language. Let's say Chad's love language is personal touch. Does, but, but Chad's wife is not even close to personal touch, but okay. So then does Chad put on his wheel, all kinds of things like massage or whatever those things are that gets him his personal touch? Yeah. But listen, what, what's important is it goes back, Matt, to both of y'all taking the love language test together so that you're not, you're not trying to learn your love language. You're trying to learn, learn your spouse's love language. Now, the truth is, if Chad wants to go get a massage, he ought to put that on the wheel. Yes. <laughs> but because Mary used to go every other week to get her nails done. And I decided one time I'd go with her. And she said, you ought to get yours done. I loved it. <laughs> when they got to COVID, we had to quit going. I hated it. <laughs> so what I've been doing recently is biting my nails and asking Mary to fix them. So she literally comes over there and fixes them. Now, eventually she's going to let me go back because I like getting my toes done more than anything else. When they do that little foot thing for you, that's special. But, but listen, I would have never guessed to go do that. Somebody said, that's just being a sissy. You're doing this. I said, you never been. <laughs> you ever go get it done, you'll love it. So put, put those kind of things there, Matt. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, most guys have personal touch on either their first or their second choice. Well, and remember, you have to remember, though, get your mind out of the gutter. But right. It's it's honestly non-sexual physical touch. I, of course, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that that that's what you have to remember. Um, you know, some people just like having an arm around. Them. Some people just like holding hands. Yep. But if your spouse hates holding hands, then they've got to learn that that's your primary language. Mm hmm. So your spouse got to be all in with you when you're doing this. Okay, somebody else. If, if there are no questions, I didn't do a good job. I have a quick question, Roy. Um, when you were talking about the uh, the biblical, uh, the requirements for a biblical union, I, I might have missed what you meant by fellowship. So can you just recap that? Well, what I said was very simply, I, tell, I say fellowship is two fellas in one ship that you're both headed in the right direction. You're both headed in the same direction. If you've ever been, you get Jennifer Hernandez, if you know her, to get her to tell you a story about her and her husband trying to go canoeing. 
They were canoeing together and they were paddling in complete opposite directions. So all they did was sit there and go in a circle. And that's what happens in marriages too often. We're just going around in circles because we're not in a fellowship together moving in the same direction. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Who else? Yes, Sam. You said finances. You said, is it okay to have a number in mind? It's just don't be this, the only goal we have, have something bigger plan afterwards. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have all the numbers you want, but I'm telling you, don't, don't think that's the end zone. That's just the end of the quarter. Okay. How do we order a wheel? Um, me or Chad, one will send it to you. <laughs> you got to make your own wheel, though. Okay. You know, I, I made mine inside of um, inside PowerPoint. Ah, nice. I think one of the best tactics you've given me, Roy, that really helped out Kristen in my marriage is, is, is no screens at night after we put the girls to bed. There's at least 15 minutes to a half an hour where we're communicating with each other and it's just us. Uh, and that's, that's really where I try and speak her love language. And I know she does mine. And that's just, Good. I mean, we've, we've grown a ton since you, you gave us that little assignment. Okay. And Boy, listen, all, all of you guys, I, if you ever want to talk to me, just give me a call. I'll talk to any of you. Roy, for the eight requirements of a biblical union for future, do you think that really just coincides with having that relational attitude and keeping each other informed about what your relation or what your future wants to be? Yeah, yeah. You know, listen, again, it's not about, it's, it's not your place, Ryan, to say, I want our future to be this. It's mm -hmm. how do you see our future? Where are we headed? Where are we going? You, you know, listen, if you don't have a target, you, you miss it every time. So you, you got to have some, something you're looking forward to. Anybody else? Well, Chad, I appreciate you letting me do this today. I hope it's what you thought it would be. I hope you got a Capitol Grill experience. Absolutely. Th Give it up for Pastor Roy. Thank you, Roy. I have this recorded. I will forward it out. And uh, just thank you for always pouring into us. And I hope everyone has a lovely and fantastic Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone.